Good morning, Katie. Hi, Mark. Right. Yeah. Thanks for, for being with us today. So I um, asked you to come along on this episode of Neo Chats today because we're, we're talking about uh, future skills and unpacking all the kind of, um, you know, these terms that people throw around that everyone knows, words like creativity, um, but might not know a lot about what that actually means in reality, or there might be some myths around it and stuff. So um, thanks for being with us today. And would you mind just just letting our audience know, for those that don't know you, just a little bit about, about yourself, you know, where you're based, what you do, and what kind of led you into working with, with creativity? Wow, okay. So um, I'm Katie. I'm based here in, in Barcelona in Spain. Um, I work with people across the world, uh, thanks to all the digital connections we have these days. And um, I uh, am founder of Step Up Create, which is a company that focuses on um, really kind of implementing creativity and helping people to leave more, lead more creative lives. Um, my background is very varied. <laughs> um, my, my degree initially was in drama and then I went into law and tried to be very serious for quite a while and went into business um, and soon sort of realized, well, not soon, kind of a bit later on realized that maybe that wasn't quite a good fit for me uh, and moved off and did my own thing, trained as a coach, um, as a transdisciplinary art therapist and an artist as well. So now I'm bringing all of these bits together and trying to help people to connect their creativity and what creativity means to them. Um, try and figure out that on a personal basis rather than kind of a blanket, this is creativity and you need to learn this kind of way. Okay, so when you say they, who, who are the people you actually work with? So I work with um, sort of three different sets of people, really. First of all, I work a lot with business schools um, and creativity there tends to come under either leadership or innovation. So depending on the school and how they've got things sorted out, we work on both of those. Um, and the students I work with in business schools go from undergraduate students through to um, the Bologna masters, the sort of young master students, MBA students, and even executive uh, MBA or executive students. So there's quite a big range of people that I work with. Obviously, I adapt <laughs> the content to each of those. Um, then I also work directly with individuals, usually people who are looking to change their lives a bit, sort of more on the life coaching or business coaching side, trying to move to a more creative approach in life. And then I also work directly with companies who are often getting me to train uh, high potentials uh, in the areas of creativity, getting their teams to work better creatively, this kind of co-creation in the company, and especially now online. How do we co-create online and how do we create that connection between teams that's necessary in order to really get some, some kind of productive development and innovation going on? What I'm, what I'm thinking listening to you there is that um, creativity is clearly, it's embedded in the fabric of your life, you know, in the way that, that things have evolved and the way that you've kind of taken all these disparate elements and fashioned them together to to, to bring to bear all of that experience and, 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 you know, support people in this very particular area. Um, but it's interesting that I find it almost a bit of a contrast that you said that um, creativity is sort of nestled under things like leadership and innovation in business schools. And that to me is um, possibly indicative of the, you know, some of the, some of the myths around creativity, you know, that it belongs in certain spaces only. Whereas, you know, in your life, you can see it's embedded throughout. So, I mean, in a, in a nutshell, um, big question, but <laughs> what is creativity to you? Hmm. Creativity to me is about taking a creative approach to life. Okay, <laughs> so that's probably not helping define it that much, but um, <laughs> it's not about um, painting and drawing and music and and all of this and how much of that creative stuff you do. It's about how you approach life and how you approach problems and how you approach things that get thrown at you. Um, we were just talking earlier about the pandemic and all of the problems that have come from that. And creativity for me is about how do you take that and look at what's possible from here. What can I create from here rather than how does this stop me from moving forward? So I think it's more, 
that kind of area um, rather than kind of literally creating things, although literally creating things is obviously part of it as well. Um, but you're the thing you are literally creating might be uh, your kids, you're, you're bringing up your kids in a creative way, or you're creating your podcast or your, um, I don't know, reading and, and writing a book or whatever, it could be many, many different things, even the company itself or a creative approach to your student life. Um, yeah. So for me, it's, it's a very wide concept. And I think that's why it's seen as one of the future skills. I mean, companies, when they talk about creativity being important, they're not talking about having more people who can draw in their company. <laughs> uh, they're talking about people who can deal with this Volker environment, this environment that's constantly changing and come up with solutions or approaches. They don't even have to be proper solutions, just who are willing to sort of jump into the swimming pool and, and try and do something. So when, when you're talking about all this, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm recognizing elements of when, when we worked together in Barcelona and, and you were teaching uh, innovation and design thinking, um, how much of this is inspired by by that process? Because a lot of what you're talking about about the, the kind of stepping back, and the, you know, and the, the creative approach to things, um, and just looking at a, a new way to sort of frame, to frame things, um, and and sort of reposition tends to come from. Well, I mean, it, it sounds like a lot of it is based in that that way of thinking. Um, how much of that uh, influenced your current sort of take on creativity and this journey of yours into this niche? Yeah. So I would say that um, it's not just the design thinking. I think all of the different things that I've done, and this is a good point for everybody, right? So all of the different things that we do in life contribute to how we are creative and what our interpretation of creativity is. So in my case, I've worked a lot in design thinking. What I really love about design thinking is this idea of there being different um, steps in the process. So we don't tend to be excellent at all phases of the process. Um, when we think of someone who's creative, we think of someone who's good in the ideation phase, for example, the crazy ideas, the mad person who, you know, really blue sky thinking, whatever, um, and probably dresses in really bright clothes and all of this. Um, <laughs> we have a real stereotype of creativity. Um, but there are uh, another four phases that um, also have different types of creativity associated. And your creativity might be associated with being able to get information from a lot of data. So really kind of nail down what is the problem that needs to be solved here from all of this data. Now that doesn't sound like a typically creative profile and yet it's super important. We need those people and we all need to have a little bit of that kind of creativity. If we're unable to filter large amounts of data, we, we're not going to get anywhere in today's world, right? We're not even going to be able to buy a car. <laughs> so, yeah. or, and a car is a big thing, right? Maybe a pen is going to be a challenge for us. <laughs> um, so I think one thing that's important from design thinking is the idea that there are different phases in the, in the process, in any creative process. And this could be applying the double diamond approach that you get from di design thinking where you're opening up and getting lots of ideas and closing down and opening up again and closing down to get your final uh, solution. Or it could be even an artistic process. So I'm an artist, I do, I paint and when I'm painting, I go through different stages of a creative process where I'm playing and trying to see what comes up from the play. And then I'm focusing down and being discerning. What am I keeping in? What do I want to paint over? And this kind of, um, this, this sort of difference between play and focus, play and focus, I think has a lot to do with creativity and my perception yeah. of it. So I'd say there's that. And there's also, um, so I have a, a lot of coach training and therapy training, um, transdisciplinary art therapy. Now, obviously, I don't bring in art therapy exactly how, it, how we're taught it in art therapy into the classroom, into a business classroom. Um, but there are lots of ideas there about how to use um, actual kind of physical creativity, painting something, drawing something, creating some music to then be able to translate into this idea of creativity in life, not just to sort of leave it there on the paper and go, oh, what a lovely painting, that's it. 
in art therapy, we don't care about the painting. Yeah. <laughs> we care about what the painting <laughs> means and, and what the communication is behind the painting. Um, so I think that there are lots of different bits of my background that I bring into my understanding of creativity. Um, and I hope that for everybody else, that's, that's also the case, that we, we have our own interpretation of creativity from what we've lived and um, yeah, from how we've been able to make sense from things we've done in life, mm -hmm. even if that is not inherently creative. I mean, I, I remember when I was in Japan um, in 2011, I walked up Mount Fuji just because you could, that was one of the times you could <laughs> do it, right? That's not inherently creative. And yet that whole process of walking up a mountain and then, you know, getting halfway through and being, oh, this is so frustrating. I don't know what to do, but I, I've got to continue. Well, I've got to decide, do I continue or do I go back down? And it's exactly the same as a creative process. So yeah. I think a lot of it is about sense making as well. And well, that's, that that's the role of you as a as a facilitator. Um, you know, that's that's an interesting part of it is sense making because you know, right. So there's clearly kind of, you know, there are myths out there about creativity. You know, we talk about it as being uh, part of certain roles or, you know, uh, or, or you talked about the stereotype of creativity. You know, there's a lot of that kind of thinking. It's very pervasive thinking around creativity. And so, you know, when you're, when you're sort of working with this um, in the classroom or in the boardroom or whatever, you're drawing on this broad arsenal you know um of experiences and you're picking things from your toolkit and adapting them to the situation like you're you're able to recognize that your art therapy might not um in its intact original form serve this purpose but you're able to to take elements and fashion them to to fit the context now that that takes a lot of um experiential development doesn't it i mean and so it brings me to the idea of when you're actually working with people who have come through, we could say conditioning, but certainly the, the, the narrative around them is that creativity is X. And, mm. and there's a lot of people telling themselves, I am not creative. Mm. So how do you actually begin to support them to, to look at their own experiences as resources? Yeah. You know, what, what is the process of <clears throat> helping somebody um, develop that sense of agency around creativity, which I guess would be the first thing. I mean, it's not like they're going to leave a session with you and say, right, I'm creative now. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you would never claim that. Um, but, but how do you start them off on the journey to, to help them at least see the tools that are at their disposal? Yeah. So I think the first thing is to, yeah, like you say, it's not, it's not something that can happen in one session. Um, whether that's a coaching session or whether that's a training session. Um, it's something that needs to be done little by little. So what I tend to do is, um, uh, first of all, have a very good, clear talk with the client. <laughs> um, and the client <laughs> being the, the business school or the company or the, the individual, right? You know, what, what is the situation? What do you want? Sometimes I use kind of a, a temperature gauge of how much creativity do you want into this? How, how far do you want me to push people? Because I can take executives who've never done anything creative uh, on paper. We don't know what they've really done. And make them do improvisational theater um, but that's a big shock and that can be really hard so what I tend to do when I when I'm sort of talking with the client is find out what the situation is what people have done so far what what courses have they done or how how have they sort of stretched their creativity so far um, and then design th something that starts to move towards that in the beginning we move quite quickly so if I think about a, a one day course that I've done, um, so this is an eight hour course, we will start in the morning by really very carefully, maybe I get them to use Lego or something that's a little bit more, like we don't kind of have a, an immediate rejection towards it. Sometimes when I get the crayons out, <laughs> You see people's faces and like, oh my God, I really don't want to have to draw or, and, and obviously if you get them, if you put everyone in a circle and go, okay, everyone, now we're going to do theatre. And the faces that you get is, oh, um, they end up loving it. But anyway, I, I tended to try and build it up little by little, also giving the context and, and especially this thing about um, different types of creativity, because I think a lot of people um, 
consider themselves not to be creative because they don't feel like they fit into this kind of crazy creative thing. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of other um, versions of people that are useful for the creative process. We all have skills that are useful the, for the creative process. And so getting people to understand that a little bit more is, is a really important part. And there's, there's an interesting survey actually called the Foresight Survey, um, which I use when, when the client has money to pay for it. And if not, <laughs> we, use, we talk about it anyway. Um, but this is an external company that runs it. And they basically have a load of questions that help to define uh, what part of the creative process are you best at? Um, and if we work with that, then we can put people into different groups and, and they, can, they can really dive down into that. Even if we don't work with that, I usually will have people think about, okay, we'll explain the creative process um, and think about where do you feel most comfortable? Okay, you feel most comfortable in the def definition of the problem part, great. Now maybe put all of the people who feel most comfortable in that together. And they will then create maybe some rules or some explanations of why that's their creative uh, skill and how that fits into the main process, why it's important. And the process of doing that um, gets them to feel kind of proud of their creativity. Um, and we also observe in this, it's really interesting that the way that they work tends to reflect this type of creativity. So you'll get people who are implementers, for example, these are the guys right at the end of the process, the kind of more typical maybe business um, approach where, okay, we've got all the ideas, we've got everything done, now we're going to make it work. They will have the whole thing done, the task done within 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you'll have the, the people in the middle who are kind of getting all the ideas. They'll have loads of ideas and end up putting something together. The, the times that I've done this in a creative way, the actual image that they've created is kind of, you know, maybe circular or maybe 3D or something completely <laughs> out there. Uh, you got the people who are working on the prototypes, they tend to be a sort of engineering type of um, uh, personality and they'll be very clear on exactly what they want to say and, and how it's moving forward. I don't know, that it's, it's just a kind of interesting way in the beginning to really establish, look, everyone's creative so you're not even going to go into your teams in the creative process where i'll later mix up the teams obviously um so that there's people from all different uh types of creativity let's say in the teams um so they're not going to go into that before they've kind of taken stock of this i am creative this is my creativity it doesn't matter that i'm not the super ideas person because i can get someone to do that um yeah you know, I can get, I can, I can build on that. I can identify who in my team is best at that. Um, I don't need to be the the one who covers the whole process. So that's yeah. a bit of a long answer. <laughs> no, it's it's great, and I think I think it's it's super important. I mean, the work you're doing, it it's it, in a way, you know, I hope you hope you understand what I mean here. But it's kind of unfortunate that it's necessary, but it definitely is because I mean, you know, there's there's people that have. They've come through a system, as you said, that, that that's that's told them that creativity is one thing, and they've they've kind of written it off. And I've, my goodness, I mean, I, I've worked in in the classroom. I've I've actually said the sentence, okay, I'd like us to imagine, and I've gotten that far, and I've had somebody say to me, oh, I can't, I can't do that. I can't, well, yeah. you can't, you can't imagine, like no, you know, they they write themselves off, even at the ability to be to think hypothetically, <laughs> you know. Yeah, a and lot it's just of it is what they tell mindset, themselves, isn't it? It's um, absolutely so much about yeah. that, and um, helping people to just get rid of those limiting beliefs just for the moment. Just, I mean, yeah. you know, limiting beliefs they're really ingrained. We can't get rid of them just like that, but we can kind of tone them down. And go, okay, in this space. We're gonna we're gonna get rid of that. And actually, talking about space, one of the things that really inspires me about creativity and creating these spaces is that I think that just this space of trust that you create in this kind of environment is valuable on its own. Um, so for me, if I'm able to create this this sense of trust in the students where they really feel supported and they feel like they can take risks and be a little bit more vulnerable. I know that that is already a huge step for them. And this connects because when I was growing up, I, um, I had a drama teacher who basically had 40 kids uh, who were probably, you know, from 11 to 16 in, in the class. 
And she completely defended that space. You were not allowed to laugh. You were not allowed to, I mean, laugh at other people. You're allowed to laugh at what's okay. going on. Um, and it was, I just remember I was, I was kind of a kid that um, really, you know, didn't feel very confident about stuff. I just lost my mum to mental illness. So there was a lot of kind of bad stuff going on. But I remember going into drama classes and just feeling like, wow, this is so nice to be in this space of trust. And I think that we still need that um, yeah. as adults and as young people. And so many people that I have in my classes that are doing master's degrees. So they've, they've gone through three or four years of bachelor's and maybe some time at work and they're doing a master's degree. And they write to me afterwards, afterwards going, it was just amazing having that space and that trust that we created in the group. And this could be when I'm teaching storytelling or um, when I'm teaching leadership, it, it doesn't really matter what <laughs> what's being taught. It's more about creating that space that allows for creativity as well. Yeah, and, and creativity and diversity <clears throat> of creativity, I suppose, because that's the thing, isn't it? Is that um, what you're doing is exploring um, the, the, the strength of diversity you know, in teams, which of course, I mean, you mentioned, you know, things like the sort of Belbin roles or whatever, the, the implementers and things like that, but yeah. they were very much, you know, I'm not really sure about those things because it does very much um, help people to understand themselves as, as I am this thing and not, you know, I'm fluid. I have fluid experiences um, that are not finished yet and I can still change and develop and all of that stuff is really important to, to kind of understand. But um, what, what you're working with a lot, it seems is, you know, there's a lot of um, creating trust and creating a safe space and getting past, you know, the self-limiting beliefs, which is really, of course, not easy. And what you were mentioning earlier about um, through play, um, through iteration, through experiential learner directed um, engagement, you know, to, to, to see what, what what's inside you and to have the space and be supported to reflect on it. Now, obviously, that that's clearly missing from the earlier stages of education, which is why we're in the situation where we have people with self-limiting beliefs and all of that. But as I see, here we are. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder, um, given the status quo and that things are not going to change overnight, what do you think? Um, what do you think sort of higher education? So in two parts, higher education and um, companies can do to support the development of creativity you know, in their within their walls you know rather than saying you know creativity is in these subjects or creativity is in these task types mm. you know what what can they do to say well look we these are the people we've got in our charge and care right now um you know how can we support this yeah for me i mean the number <laughs> one thing is is this admitting mistakes allowing people to make mistakes so there are some companies that have a culture and this and this could be schools as well right so mm -hmm. that there's a culture of right and wrong and wrong is bad <laughs> and also that um that you can't create something um and then have that thing fail so for example in my classes what i try and do and this is always really difficult because we've got to give a grade right in the in the business school classes is I try and make sure that most of the class, that there's a participation grade, but it's not graded, for example, of teaching storytelling. I don't grade them on their stories until the final day because I want them to be able to make mistakes um, and to not feel like I've got to really, you know, hit myself <laughs> over the back for, for making a mistake because this is not just an external thing. It's also internal. We also have this kind of internalized of, no, it has to be perfect. It has to go well. In my recent course on storytelling, there was a girl who completely forgot what she was saying um, on day two. And she was addressing the whole class, telling the story. She'd done really well. She'd prepared it, everything perfect. She just completely blanked. And, you know, that it didn't matter. It really didn't matter at all. And you could just feel the whole class kind of, if you could get any closer, because obviously social distance, this was an in-person <laughs> class. If you could get any closer, they would have been like literally hugging her. Yeah. Um, but uh she she failed that day um and she came back on the last day and she did it really really well she came up to me afterwards and she said if i hadn't failed that second day i wouldn't have done this so well um so it's it's about thinking of 
uh, failures or mistakes as a way to learn. And this is this is what happens in, in design thinking. We're talking about iteration, right? We want things to fail quickly, uh, fail cheaply, um, fail as, as early as possible so that we can we can correct them and move forward. And when you're in business school or any other kind of um, education, it's a great place to be testing things out and failing because it's not gonna affect your job. And then afterwards, <clears throat> Here's the bit where the, the culture's got to change a bit in companies. And again, some sectors are really completely averse to this. And I'd like to see that change because on the one hand, a lot of companies are saying, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of supporting creativity. But on the other, they're kind of putting on these um, DPOs and things that, you know, really means that you've got to hit your objectives really, really hard and there's no space for any kind of failure. So that would be number one. Um, I think you mentioned earlier about diversity. That's a really important part of creativity. So having teams that are as diverse as possible, and this is not just sort of nationality, training, uh, skin color, really as diverse as possible, trying to understand people more. So like the, um, the acquire, the, not the inherent diversity, but the acquired diversity. Um, so things like ways of thinking and stuff like that, or <coughs> exactly culture and you're gonna be able to be more creative. Um, mm -hmm. The more different people you have and the more different approaches you have. Um, sometimes it surprises me, and I'm not gonna say the names of the schools, but you might have something that looks like a really diverse picture of people from all over the world. Um, some differences in age, some differences in background, but actually on paper, when you get them in the class, it tends to be the same level of privileged society. Um, from different countries and that doesn't help creativity no. so also allowing you know having some kind of things that allow students from poorer backgrounds or from different backgrounds to join in and be part of the conversation in these top business schools uh, would be really really important for creativity and the other is obviously in in terms of business schools allowing the time um, Creativity isn't like finance. There isn't a right or wrong. We need to have um, a, a block of at least two hours, maybe even four, um, to be able to teach this. And that's even with a flipped classroom. So even if you've got all of the theory online, you've got video lectures, you've got, you're really making the most of this blended learning, um, you've got to have around at least two hours because I need to be able to, we need to sort of start the mindset, get people feeling comfortable, create the trust, decentralize, um, which is where we sort of go off and do something else and then come back and take the meaning from that. And obviously the meaning part is important, but if we skip straight to that without going through the experience, there isn't a change that's a sort of sustainable change. So how, how do you sustain that change? I mean, what, you know, if you've got we, we all know the limitations of of working with schools and things and of course it depends on you know sometimes it is just box ticking i mean let's be honest it's it, sometimes it's for the school not for you and not for the people that are with you but for yeah. the school it can be like okay um social media we're doing we're supporting our students to develop creativity and the le leadership and whatever and it looks great um but then they're they're giving you okay there's there's two hours um, you know, yeah. whereas in an ideal world, I mean, you'd be off on a, an island retreat with them, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, we're, we're not kind of able to, to really get what, what, what we need all the time. But um, with, with the tools that you have, I mean, what can you do when, when you, these people are leaving your, your session and you might never see them again? Mm. Um, you know, what are they able to, to carry forward um, to check back on? You know, is, do they... Do they kind of um, arrive at certain commitments to themselves as they're kind of, um, you know, journaling prompts built in? Is there, um, yeah. do you sort of give them a moment or uh, mm -hmm. I guess a toolkit for self-reflection metacognitively that they can come back to? How, how do you sort of say, well, this is the best shot you've got of sustaining that change outside these four walls? Yeah, so it's a little bit, a lot of the tools that you're mentioning, really, um, now we've, we're used to dealing with technology. This is fantastic because yeah. um, I think some people think that a creative class has to be in person and that doesn't is not the case. It's true that there's a special thing with teaching in person, which I think everybody who teaches and loves it 
misses <laughs> with teaching on Zoom. Yeah. But at the same time, you can do some amazing stuff online. And one of the great things is that you can build these blended programs. So it can be two hours in class, which are really highly experiential. And then afterwards, you can have all these different reflections. So usually if I've got two hours, um, most of it is dedicated, obviously, to mindset, then the actual activity, which is a creative process. Um, the, and then the reflection on that tends to be relatively short in the moment. Um, but afterwards, students will have questions for reflection. And I always get them also to think about either their first next step, um, so that that one thing they're going to do after this, or even to define some smart goals that they're going to achieve in the next um, the next month or so. So it's not just about bringing in art therapy stuff. There's a lot of business stuff that comes sort of directly from MBA and, and things like that, that, that can be Im implemented here to make sure that this moves forward. Um, for me, the important thing is that the students reflect personally on this, that it's not something that I can give them. Okay, here's a, here's a list of things to do afterwards they each have a, an experience that is different depending on how they came in um, and also depending on their mindset or their, their situation that particular day or whatever. There's loads of things that, that change this. Um, and really getting them to reflect is important. So I put a grade on this when it's a, when it's a, a student, uh, when it's a, a master's program, or whatever, I put a grade on the reflection basically because I think we all try and get out of doing this. I mean, if I'm honest, mm -hmm. I try and get out of doing it. Like I don't always journal when I, when I should do. Um, so I put a grade on this, but it's not the grade of the content. It's more, you know, how reflective has, have you been? Yeah. Um, how much it. have you revealed your, yourself? Yeah. I mean, it's the vulnerability, yeah. isn't it? It's the emotional engagement. Um, it's hard to do that in a business school environment because they're so sort of cerebral sometimes. And, and, you know, a lot of the classes are about, knowledge rich uh, yeah. environments you know where the knowledge is prized uh, yeah. and not the, the the sort of the engagement or the self-awareness um it, it's very difficult to to get that from people or to support them to sort of see well look this is this is not about the grade but this is something that's going to be so good for you if you could dig yeah. a little bit deeper um it'll it'll you know be worth its weight in gold a bit later I tell you what, it's really difficult to grade. It's, it's yeah, a nightmare yeah. because I, I want to make sure that each individual is graded on how, you know, how they came in and how they're leaving rather than, you know, giving uh, extra points to someone who's done some kind of retreat or whatever, who is a little bit more self-aware because, you know what, I'm most interested in working with people who, aren't, who believe they are not creative. Yeah. It would be easier to work with the people who are super creative and the artists and all of that. And it's really fun to have them in the class. Um, but I'm most interested where I can really make a difference. And I think that's with people who come in and they've got all these resistances. They're like, you know what, this, you know what, I signed up for this because it was the only thing that would fit in uh, with my study tour or whatever else I'm doing. And, you know, I get them to say this in yeah. the beginning because I'd rather it just be clear. Yeah. Um, and then over the, the time, they kind of make a little shift. And those little shifts from the outside, I might think, okay, well, they've just, they've just literally made a tiny shift and admitted that at that point, they felt like they were really creative and contributing to the team. But for them, that's huge, right? So yeah. it's, it's really difficult to look at it from the outside. Um, and it's kind of a skill that I think that's where my art therapy comes in, that it's, you know, really taking this phenomenological approach and, and trying to look at what's going on um, in its entirety rather than judging people or thinking, OK, well, this person is going to be more difficult. And I don't know. Yeah. This is uh, this is something about this trying to make a change in a very short period of time. But I think we are all capable of that. It's like planting a seed, you know, that film mm -hmm. Inception. It's like, yeah. like planting a seed that, you know, maybe I am creative, even though I thought, think and thought I'm not. Maybe I could be creative. And just if I'm able to plant that seed, I think that can that can come into flourishing later on. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's interesting because it's like your, um, your class is kind of something apart from the rest of the school. Um, it's like, a, it is a space where 
it's not very helpful for say uh, another professor to say here's all the things i think about these students so you know you've got this guy and that person in your class and all that because you know based on a very different space you know and you're ta you're meeting people where they are um and the interesting thing is i love that as well that people have absolutely no uh, idea of what's going to happen um and in that environment they can often get surprising things from themselves just when i, I think it's often interesting to see who you are when you're simply um put in a certain environment and said okay what what have you got you know what's what's inside um and you yeah. learn a lot about yourself like that you know and once you know that you can do it it's incredibly empowering as well so sometimes it can just be the strength of the experience i just actually making me remember um i don't know if you remember this but when we worked together in asadi um and uh we taught social leadership together and we were welcoming the students. I think there was the new cohort. There was a couple of hundred people in this lecture theater. And you leaned across to me and said, um, what are you going to talk to them about? And I said, what? I didn't know. And I had missed the email that said I was going to have to talk to them. <laughs> um, and I hadn't prepared anything at all. And everyone had these really well prepared things. Um, and I had to simply stand up and, and tell a story and a few off color jokes and and, and basically wing it and it was really enjoyable but you know unless you're put in the situation you'll never actually know that that you can do those kinds of things so it's yeah, it's I mean, creating opportunities I mean, isn't it also thinking about the future for for these students they're going to be in those situations all the time at yeah. work and like they're going to be doing presentations in five minutes or you mm -hmm. know meeting a client because the other their boss isn't there or all of these things we we tend to sort of try and avoid putting ourselves into these situations where we don't feel comfortable um, or convince ourselves. Now I'm, I'm thinking of this while, I, while I'm saying it or convince ourselves that we're putting ourselves in an uncomfortable situation when really it's not that uncomfortable. So what could we do yeah. to push ourselves a bit more? Um, and this is interesting, actually, it connects to when I'm, when I'm thinking about it now, it connects to the importance of traveling, right? And being able to kind Definitely. of just travel on your own and, uh, you know, obviously right now it's a little bit difficult, but um, I've traveled the world on my own. I know you've done a lot of traveling as well um, because I was I was lucky enough at times to have a job that sent me to some interesting places and I managed to get the weekend or a week and go and do some stuff. But just, just being in a situation that you are not in control of, that you are not particularly comfortable with and trying to find a way out or, or a way to enjoy it more, um, is a way of of sort of developing creativity. So yeah. I think there's there's a, a lot about creativity which we think needs to be taught in the classroom when actually it it is explored outside the classroom. And what I've been working on a little bit more recently is this idea of sense making. Like mm -hmm. we live a lot of stories. We live a lot of things. And that goes the same for if you're, 40 uh, as, as if you're 20, you know, you've lived loads of different things. Some students say to me in storytelling, oh, do you think I don't have so many stories because I'm younger? <laughs> like, no, I think you've got loads of stories. Yeah. And even if you've never left your country, you've got loads of stories. Um, but the thing that we tend to fail to do, and I, again, I include myself in this, is to stop and make sense of what we've lived. Mm -hmm. So what you know, in this trip I just took, what was the most important thing about that trip? Unless someone interviews you like you're doing now, <laughs> we quite often don't don't stop and make sense of it. And I think that's true for, for our generation. It's even more true yeah. for the younger generation who are often having to make stories of it uh, on Instagram um, that are not very deep. And they're just kind of stories for someone else. Um, rather than really looking at what what went on there. So I think there's a, a lot of education that could be placed on finding on sort of finding the important things that have happened in your life and just focusing yeah. a little bit on that and then helping people to find their voice um, and yeah. using those to to sort of say, you know, I've learned this and this is why it's important. And that for me is all inherently creative. I would I would completely agree with that and echo it and say that you know that it's not really ever going to be likely to happen in a very kind of top-down old-fashioned system where you know say in education a professor's coming in with this pre-prepared class that is a script that is rigid and rather than okay let's find out who's here you know let's find out 
what the shared lived experiences are in the classroom and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's 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 things like that that are really important. But as you say, it's it's actually kind of normalizing reflection and talking about it and not just like a it's an assessed activity, but this is something that strengthens your life because it's it, you've got to stop at sometimes and look around. And you, you're right, people don't do it until way later, until you're sitting on your rocking chair with a tartan rug over the knees and watching the storm rolling in and reflecting on your, your life. And then, and then, you know. Yeah, I can tell you're in Scotland and not in Barcelona. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the t there's a lot of tartan rugs here. Um, there's um, <laughs> a lot of there's, storms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's one right now, actually, yeah. Um, but it, I think, uh, you know, there's things, as you said, you mentioned online. I mean, there are, there are um, so many opportunities now, and I, I guess it's about directing people towards these things. Like there's, you know, I'm doing a course just now called a year of a year of writing to uncover the authentic self. Mm. And I think I paid 40 euros for it. And every week they send you a prompt and it just, it asks you to reflect on a certain element of your life. And it's like, you know, you and I have both traveled and that means that sometimes the experiences are a little bit more fragmented. And there's so much gold in there to if you if you take the time to mine it, um, and this makes you stop and sit down for a couple of hours each week and say, "What was that like? What did I take forward from that?" Yeah, and and really that's that's just as simple as that, isn't it? Is 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 reflecting on on what's brought you to where you are, and actually realizing that the tapestry that makes up your life is is such a strength. Yeah, um, and there are things you can draw on. Uh, you don't have to fit into this category or that category because you know, the, the experiences you have make you a unique asset to, to any team, because if diversity is valued, as you say, mm -hmm. but so, I mean, I guess that if you're able to at least encourage or, or spark that reflective process, even in a couple of hours, mm -hmm. I guess that's something that could be really valuable, couldn't it, to take forward. Yeah, the other thing that comes from that is the idea of responsibility. And I think this is important mm -hmm. because it's it's difficult. I think today, um, quite a lot of education, um, we take on the responsibility for everything. It's like, um, you know, not yeah. not only has this person got to, um, or certainly, I mean, I tend to do this sometimes, right? Um, not only has this person got to, you know, get all the leadership ideas that I'd like them to get from this, be more creative, be more reflective, all of this. But, you know, I've got to be able to have helped them to do all of this stuff. And actually, we need to sort of step back and go, OK, this is about giving people the tools and the mindset to be able to do this stuff on their own. Um, and I think that's the case, whether they're the age of my son, who's four, uh, or whether they're like 24 um, and everything that's in between and, and even going forward. It's it's about um, there is an element about helping people to be responsible for their own lives and their own creativity, their own education. And that means that there, there has to be, you know, a really high level from the schools. Uh, there has to be um, a responsibility felt by the schools and this, and this responsibility now, I think, that's important for schools to feel is, okay, all this new technology and all this willingness to accept online training, how do we make the very best of that? How do we yeah. make the best mix possible between online and offline so that this is an amazing experience for the student and also helps them to have these tools to move forward? Um, I think that is something that I don't see all schools and all professors doing. No, no, it, um, it's a shift, isn't it, from education to empowerment. Mm in in a way but that it's a it's a very different it's a very different mindset i mean you mentioned earlier on the kind of the vaca world you know that this volatile uncertain world that we're going into and in that world a focus on on what you know rather than who you are is is not going to serve us i mean if we can support people as you say to be the best versions of themselves and take responsibility for themselves mm. um that that's got to be enough the problem with that is and not not a problem i don't see it as a problem but for institutions is measurements outcomes for something that you can't ultimately control or even see that will manifest itself in somebody's life some point later down the line so how yeah. do i report that how do i put it in an excel well this is a classic you know? thing with leadership isn't it and leadership yeah. and creativity and things like that um what if i think back to when i was studying my mba I fell into this as well, thinking, oh, what, you know, all this leadership stuff, you know, why, why are we spending so much time on this? <laughs> um, and there were, you know, guys in my class, you know, Spanish macho guys who were like, yeah, you know, I love finance. Why, why do I even have to study this? And then, you know, now we're 10 years later than when I graduated from my MBA. And 
I know that if I ask them, what is the cause that had the lasting impact on you, the most sort of impact of the whole MBA, they will say leadership. It's the case for me. And it was the case for the last <laughs> then a few years ago, I spoke to them about it. And it was the case then it's like, yeah, you know, I thought it was, you know, really easy and kind of a bit light at the time, nothing serious, nothing applied. But then <laughs> later on, you think that this sort of little things are coming in. Oh, yeah, you know, I remember this. And, and I remember going through that experience of discovering a little bit about who I am and yeah. feeling okay with it. And also knowing, I think you mentioned earlier, this idea of being fluid, right? This mm -hmm. is, there's something here that's interesting about identity and, and we all have a, a fluid identity really. And yeah. yet we are generally forced into this idea of personal brand and what are my key um, selling points and all of this, they kind of work against each other. And so it's, it's all about trying to find a medium between, you know, what's expected of us, where we need to get to in life and in work and whatever. And then on the other side, being okay with this, yeah, you know what, I'm okay with me and I'm okay with my experiences and I've learned all this stuff from it. So I don't know, there's a, there's a lot of things here, which I'm not sure how much of it is, should be on the schools. Um, yeah. And how much of it is on the individual. And I think that the, the part that the schools can do is to just kind of start that process, to kick it off, to, to make people think, okay, first of yeah. all, I, I can be creative. Um, I'm not just sort of a non-creative person because I like maths. You know, there are some super creative mathematicians, yeah, for example. Of course, but, yeah. Um, so just sort of kicking off that idea and then and then letting them letting them go and do their own thing. But at the same time, obviously, mm -hmm. taking seriously this wonderful opportunity we have now to, to be creative online and to, to use all these tools. I, I love technology, so I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love technology and I love in person. So having that mix is just like creating a richer world. Yeah. Um, and also, I think being able to meet students where they are, um, both in terms of where they are um, personally and also where they are digitally. Like if they're more comfortable online, so I'm teaching storytelling again, there are students who feel much more comfortable talking to a video camera than in person. We work on both of those um, because mm -hmm. they're both important now. And so I think there's, there's an element of creativity and we all have to be creative now in terms of figuring out what can we do? What's the best thing we can do with all the tools we've got? Because we've got loads of tools. <laughs> well, and you can see the very physical manifestation of that in the last year with, you know, people who were on one path. And I mean, you know, everybody, everybody, um, unless you're maybe a web designer or something like that, you know, I mean, most of us, uh, the, all the things we were doing just kind of suddenly um, fragmented and disappeared. And, and, and you can see the, the difference in the way that people reacted. And some people, you know, were just like, okay, I, I don't know what else to do. And there were other people who, who almost didn't pause and just kind of, you know, took a moment, gathered themselves and, and pivoted and did something else. And, and we can see that, um, how helpful it is in life in, in, in the world of uncertainty. And, you know, this is not our last rodeo. I mean, there's other stuff around the corner for sure. Yeah. Um, and so what you're talking about to me, it, it, it sounds to me like it's a case of schools almost letting go of the need to control things that are within, you know, mm -hmm. the limits of, uh, the time that the learner spends with them and say, look, instead, we're going to focus on creating space for you to figure out who you are and what you bring to the table and to support you in that reflection and to support you in developing the things that, you know, how you want to show up in the world and yeah. embracing it as a strength that we are not going to measure this because the impact is going to be in your life. Um, you know, and, and that has to be enough. And I, and I know that's idealistic. Um, but I think I, I do see, I mean, obviously I work in education. I do see that's the way the narrative is moving, has been accelerated by the last year, the digital fluidity as well. And, you know, people are beginning to let go of, of the kind of need to control because it's exhausting. Um, yeah, well, there's, I think there's traditionally been this idea that the schools have all the knowledge, <laughs> right? And then yeah. we can, we can give the knowledge to people who pay or are enrolled and that's kind of a scarce resource. So there's something around scarcity here, which is not particularly mm -hmm. helpful. And 
I guess <laughs> one of, the only thing that, that stopped me from buying 100% into your idea is that I think that it's all very well for leadership and creativity and soft skills. Um, for harder skills, I find it more difficult to figure out how to do this because when I'm, you know, I studied finance, I actually quite enjoyed the financial planning because that was super creative, but anyway, we'll get up to that <laughs> another time. Um, but there is right and wrong and there are things that need to be done, hoops that need to be jumped through in that. Um, and obviously there are lots of other ideas. I'm sure some people listening will be thinking, well, you know, I teach history. How am I going to teach that in a more creative yeah. way? Um, and I think that there is, there's a, there's a medium, isn't there? there? There has to be a way that students can get the information, the knowledge part, um, and also be able to work with and reflect on that. And I would say that, yeah. that here's where the responsibility is important. And this is really difficult. H trying to get the students to be more responsible for their own learning, um, while also leading by example and making sure that the schools are being very responsible for how they are delivering that learning. Some things are better delivered on a video lecture that's been carefully rehearsed and is all there and it's got some nice questions alongside it and, you know, it's really well done. And some things are better, uh, better given in, in person. Um, yeah. Really thinking carefully about those things, but knowing that there will be an element of, you know, some knowledge that needs to be imparted but that the most important part of it is how that other person takes that knowledge and makes it their own. Um, and yeah. if we're unable to train people in that part, in that sense-making part, there's no point. We're just memorizing stuff and it's not really very helpful. And I think that's what's happened yeah. in the past. And that's been some of the problems that we've had in, in adapting to some of these solutions that we traditionally haven't been trained uh, to yeah. understand properly the knowledge. Well, it's it's a broadening of the concept of what knowledge is in in a, in a sense because um, a knowledge rich environment. If you if you take take your point about history, for example, um, there is the memorization of historical facts, which is what I certainly experienced uh, in in school, which is of absolutely no use. Um, but the understanding of historical thinking is far more fluid, and as I able, I'm able to you know to apply that later on, and even things like finance where. You know, absolutely. There are hard skills. I mean, I want to know that um, my surgeon has gone through a pretty rigorous, <laughs> regimented structure training. You know, um, there are certain things like like that. You know, okay, fine. Um, there's definitely a place for that. And even with things like finance, I just think that um, the more we silo things, you know, if, if you can learn finance as part of a, a broader um, project, say mm -hmm. uh, in entrepreneurship, for example. And you can apply these things transversally. And I think where the weaknesses still come is that they they portion these things off in bubbles mm. and they learn them apart. And that's, you know, hard skills, absolutely, but applied transversally mm. so that we can actually draw on and we can see these things as part of like, okay, I can draw on this element and draw on that element. It might not be my strength, but I understand how it fits into the big picture. And, you know, if I get to a point where I need it, I can hire somebody who's, you know, amazing at that. Mm. Um but just to experience all those things without the risk of telling ourselves the stories that we tell ourselves about, I'm not a maths person, I'm not an X, I'm not X, I'm not Y. Um, yeah. You know, if we can de-silo these things, that that's that's an interesting step. But um, could I just ask you just one thing to 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 close off because there's, there's people listening to this saying, definitely people out there saying, you know, I'm not a creative person. Um, there are people who would not voluntarily sign up for a workshop in creativity, um, you know, unless it was maybe <laughs> mandatory, which seems kind of strange in a company to do that. Um, but to those people who are out there who who may never sign up for these kinds of things, um, what would you say to them about about creativity, about the stories we tell ourselves, or about a, a way to kind of um, questions to ask themselves about, um, you know, to 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 probe that that self-concept a little bit maybe just test that a little bit and see is is that story i'm telling myself is that the case yeah i mean i think that there's there's just a question isn't there that you could just ask yourself if you if you are able to stop and take a moment of consciousness um and just before you're going to do something and just ask yourself is that the creative approach um or is it a reactive approach so am i doing this in a way that is kind of moving something forward 
or am I kind of just reacting to something that's happened and I'm doing it kind of almost without thinking about it? I think even that can help. And I'd certainly say you don't need to do a creativity workshop um, in order to get more creative. In fact, that in order for it to be more sustainable, even if you're doing just sort of one thing that you like doing that's creative, I think most people have something that they enjoy doing that's creative. Um, again, it's, it's probably not drawing or painting. Um, it might be going for a walk. Um, it's often associated with moments where you feel good about yourself or good about what you're doing. And just identifying those um, and doing them consciously, maybe not even every day, but identifying something you love doing. Give you a non-creative example from me. I love swimming. I've always loved swimming. I used to get butterflies in my stomach when my parents would take me to the swimming pool and we used to go four times a week. So, <laughs> I mean, um, and just incorporating that into my life, it's, it's sort of an hour or half an hour a day. Um, just, it makes me feel a lot better. It makes me feel more creative or more open to creativity. So sometimes it's not about necessarily finding the creative thing. It's just finding something you love doing and doing it, <laughs> making yeah. time for that, giving yourself that space because we are so busy. Um, and this is true of everybody, whether we've got kids, whether you've got a full-time job, whether you, whatever your situation is, we're so busy that we often forget about the things that we love doing and just making a small list of them and then doing them <laughs> um, as if it's a task. You know, I've, I have this list of things that I do, every, you know, what are my three things that I want to do today? All of this. I don't put my creative task on there, but I know that I need to have either creative task or swimming every day. Otherwise, I'm just not quite as good as I'd like to be. So I think those are the, the thing I would say. Um, and if creativity scares you off, don't call it creativity, <laughs> call it something else. <laughs> um, yeah. it's, it's a really wide concept, but um, it's certainly not just about post-it notes and being crazy and coming up with lots <laughs> of ideas. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's, it's a really valuable lesson. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's important information that will make a meaningful difference to people's lives because what we're, what we're unfortunately talking about in a lot of these cases is unlearning, um, mm. you know, which is incredibly healthy um, thing to do at any stage in life, you know, so with that in mind, I would say that, you know, that what you're doing, I'm glad to know that people like you are out there doing this kind of stuff. Uh, as well, because it's an important message. And, you know, even if it's just, you know, talking to people, having conversations, normalizing certain things, broadening the concept of what creativity is, um, challenging limit, self-limiting beliefs, um, whatever way that fun. shows up. It's yeah. Like yeah. Just having a laugh can be a creative approach. So sometimes we take ourselves so seriously. It's, you know, I've seen a lot of students like this who are really, really focused on their masters or whatever they're doing. They want to get they want to get through it, get the highest grades. Unfortunately, that's what, what they need in order to get the top jobs. And they, they're kind of not having fun with it, which is quite different from when I went to university when we used to go out and <laughs> probably spend more time in the bars than in the lecture theatre. But um, <laughs> you're <laughs> nodding there, Mark. Just, just want to make sure that that's there for the podcast. Mark is nodding and agreeing. I'm just supporting you, Katie. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> um, but, yeah, there's this idea that we have to be serious all the time. And, and I think that um, that also needs to be broken down, that, that yeah. you can you can be a serious business person, serious professional and have fun and play sometimes. And sometimes yeah. that play is what you need just to open up the creativity as well. So yeah. whatever that is for you, that that's fine. Yeah. And it's liberating as yeah. well. You know, I mean, I'll never forget um, working with um, very serious executives uh, on a telephone role play and deciding that um, I was going to um, have them use bananas instead of handsets or just their hands. Um, yeah. And just the look on their faces as I presented them and I'd written the numbers onto the bananas and everything, you know, um, wow. within within seconds, they were into it. You know, they were yeah. laughing and passing the bananas around and it's for you and this is you what know. happens when I when I do stuff with Lego. Um, mm -hmm. It's amazing because it connects people with how they were when they were kids. And Absolutely, quite a lot of yeah. very serious executives or come across as serious. I don't know if they're really that serious in real life. Um, mm -hmm. We'll start kind of just building stuff and playing with it, and you can just see this sort of 
armor coming down. Yeah. And I remember one course that I did, it was a two day uh, team building workshop around creativity. Um, so this is another thing that quite often people ask us to do it as a team building or leadership or whatever. So there's actually some sort of content, but then it's a creative process that goes through it. So um, people kind of kind of don't necessarily expect that they're going to be painting and drawing and doing theater in the beginning. Um, but I remember getting the stuff out and we'd got these big boxes full of material and there were, there were wire meshes and there was paint and just loads of stuff. Um, and these executives changed from, you know, suited and booted to <laughs> little boys and girls who were playing with these new toys that they'd been given. It was so beautiful to see. And then they then they picked it up and they got it, you know, they did everything. They used all of the skills and all of the, the life experience to date to get everything together. Um, but they were able to play. And sometimes you need something that just helps you to, to rem remember that that child inside you that that likes to have fun, yeah. even though you've still got all of the responsibility um, that you carry every day. Yeah. So, I mean, so to the people that are listening that there, um, I'm sure they're getting a lot out of this and hopefully people are going to now um go out and do something fun <laughs> or do something they enjoy just to make as you say make that space for to feel better um yeah, and i think it's it's really important this year especially because mm -hmm. um we've been locked down it depending on where you are in the world the lockdowns have been you know quite brutal and <laughs> they might have been with kids without kids with your mum with you know people that you don't want to be stuck with necessarily 24 hours a day and it can be really hard. I certainly went through moments of the um, of the first lockdown here, where I just found it really, really hard. I suddenly became a like 1950s mum, and I'd never bought into that. And I think um, being able to find something within you, uh, you're not relying on there being an amazing bar down the street, or um, you know, being able to go and see your friends. You're relying on stuff within you. Um, and that's an amazing feeling to have that inside you, to be able to make yourself feel better by doing something that's within your power. Um, so I think that's, if I had to kind of advertise creativity, I think it just makes you feel better. Yeah. <laughs> and, and especially now we need to be able to find those little moments because we can't rely on going and have a beer with our friends. Um, which, you know, used to be a great kind of therapy. And now, you know, uh, well, little by little, it's opening up. We're going we're gonna to be able to do that again. But um, don't lose sight of all the wonderful things that you've probably discovered about yourself during the, during the lockdowns as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's the danger is that you kind of um, click back into routine, which, of course, is the, for me, is the thing that enslaves creativity. I mean, I've always, I've always used the word our, our birthright with creativity. You know, mm. I do feel that way about it. I do feel it's it's a way that it's something that makes you feel alive and connected, what, whatever way it manifests itself. So, um, and on that note, hopefully um, be able to have a beer with you soon in Barcelona. Yeah, great. Talk more <laughs> about this. All right, thank you so much for your time today, Katie. It's been great. You're welcome. I feel like we could just continue this conversation for the whole day, but I think we'll give everyone a, a bit of a break now. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's the only reason I'm finishing it is because we're, we're, we're trying to encourage people to go out and do something. So we better make the time for them to do it. So <laughs> otherwise we could talk for another hour. To us, do something good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stop, stop here. Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, Katie. Take Thanks. care. Bye.